in studio right now is Chief Mark Williams. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Okay, so I know you guys met with the uh, with the editorial board um, at the OD, and so I, I guess the what what we're hearing a lot of right now, and we're talking about the fire department and text messages that um, that. Came off. We're, we're, they've come off a phone of a of a potential fire recruit. I'd ask you on the text messages. Do you feel they are those text messages? The export that has been released. Do you feel that though they're authentic, that they're real? It is a conversation between the uh, the recruit and the then fire chief or the current fire chief. We do. You do feel they're authentic. Yes. Um, do you feel that it has been proven that they are just locker room talk? That they didn't turn into anything. I know from the investigation that uh, a lot of what was written on the uh, on the text messages could not be substantiated with the interviews that they did, um, but uh, there could be some reality to it. Okay, yeah. um, and and based on your knowledge of of code of conduct, um, if that stuff was going on inside on city property in a firehouse. Would that be a violation of the code of conduct? It would be. It would be. Yes. All right. Can I ask you? You said it was difficult to substantiate the text versus reality. Did you have one side saying this was reality and another side saying no, this never happened? Yes. So, um, so the chief was saying this never happened. This was just locker room talk. <clears throat> and depending on the questions asked, some of the other people you know, would be witnesses or you know potential complainants. Uh, would say the same with things as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't get that again. So um, explain that again. So the ch- the chief and some others were saying it never really happened. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there were there were statements in the text messages that included um, make sure you wear your briefs, um, make sure you bring the porn. Can you the word blowers? Uh, I guess I don't know what that officially really is. It seems to be slang, um, right? We would assume it would be, we could all, all assume what we think that is. Right. Uh, there was an awful lot of talk there that l- would lead any, I would think, any police officer to think, well, this did seem like it really kind of happened at the firehouse. Just saying, when you get here, call on the, uh, the chief's line or the, I mean, your take on that. Um, you know, I think the text messages speak for themselves. I think yeah. one of the problems we ran into was um, um, when we did speak to um, the fireman's son, um, the father was insistent on being there uh, during the interview. And, I, and in our opinion, we think that maybe he was reluctant to um, maybe add some insight into those mm-hmm. text messages because uh, some of the uh, contact that's mentioned in the email could be embarrassing. Right. So with his father right there, um, uh, maybe that's the reason why he didn't, uh, you know, come yeah. forward with some of the, the further details on it. But uh, the father was insistent that now we weren't going to speak to him without either an attorney or him being me present. Understood. Yeah. Um, certainly would be. So you're you're thinking that maybe the father was worried that uh, that some some of what might have come out of that would be very embarrassing. I don't think that it was all embarrassing anyway. I would imagine yeah, for both I, sides, for everybody involved. No, no, Mark Ambrose. I mean, he's he's, he's a quality guy from what yeah. I know. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I don't think that was the case. I think that uh, he wanted to make sure that maybe uh, his own son's rights were being uh, weren't being violated for whatever reason. Okay, yeah. all right. Can I ask when you guys did interviews? Were you able to interview anyone else um, that uh, the son allegedly brought to the firehouse with him? Um, were, were, was there corroboration from other members of the public? No, there wasn't. Uh, we did interview some of uh, the fireman's sons, friends, as well as other fighter fires during this investigation. And what, and what did you learn from that? Uh, again, a lot could not be substantiated. Um, wish I can go into detail about more. Um, did uh, was, was there any uh, anyone that was saying, "Well, this never happened"? It never, it never. Were there friends of the of the young man that was saying it never happened? I don't know if they were saying that it didn't happen, but mainly they didn't see certain things or didn't know. They didn't see things. it, right? Okay. Yeah, uh, Andrew. So uh, one of the main issues that, or one of the main things that came out of the investigation, according to the mayor, that there was nothing 
criminal that happened, but based on your knowledge of the Utica Fire Department Code of Conduct, with the text messages alone, was there enough to have some sort of violation, in your opinion, of that code of conduct? Well, when we, uh, my investigators of our professional standards did the investigation, we're always uh, looking at the facts of the investigation and comparing it to both city policies and uh, fire department policies to see what violations were committed. And we did find misconduct. All right. Um, I'm trying to, uh, I, I, I want so much to ask you your opinion, um, which I know you're probably not going to be able to, to give me, but um, I, I, from the public standpoint, people that, that we've spoken with, first of all, you have people in City Hall coming out and, and kind of getting their, uh, their side of the story out there. Um, and what you're hearing a lot of is this never happened. There's no proof that any of this stuff ever happened. Is that, a, is that an accurate statement? To a large degree, yes. I mean, based on what it's, what a, is- see, it's a he said, she, it's a he said, he said type situation going on. On a lot of the points of the investigation, yes. I yeah. mean, it's, it's only, we can only go with the facts that were given to us during these interviews and what we uncovered. Uh, um, could there be information out there that we still don't know about? Uh, or did the witnesses lie to us? That's a possibility. But, you know, we can only go with the facts that we have. When you were asked by the mayor's office to investigate, how was that presented? I got a phone call uh, late in the afternoon. I, I think it was about three-ish. Uh, was myself and my deputy chief went up to his office. Um, uh, also, there was, I think, Bill Burrell from the Corporation Council. And uh, he showed us the text messages, asked us what our opinion was. Um, and uh, from a criminal standpoint, just from looking at the text messages alone, um, we didn't feel it was criminal at that time. And uh, But, you know, I cautioned to say, once we, you know, yeah, should we yeah. do an investigation? <clears throat> you never know where it mm-hmm. ends up taking you. So, um and the mayor asked us at that point to do uh, an internal investigation with using our professional standards office. Got it. Yeah. And um, do you feel that this was presented to you differently than the Fort case? No. no the only thing that would be different was um, the way it was reported to the police. Um, um, what you had there was um, uh, the female firefighter involved, uh, you know, went home immediately after this happened, then called the police from her home. Um and then they directly contacted one of my captains, who then made me aware of it. I mean, my mayor aware yeah, of it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just the way it came in and I was reported uh, was different, I would say. All right. Yeah. After the investigation, did you guys have to submit a report to the mayor or the common council? Is that standard? And did you do that? Yes. Uh, we submitted a report, I, I want to say sometime in the early uh, first week of June, <clears throat> to Corporation Council. Um, can I ask you what... Uh, on how this story is being reported and how it's being discussed publicly, are there things that you want to address that maybe aren't true, aren't accurate, or that you want to set this record straight on? That's a pretty open-ended question. Um, you know, I, the only thing that bothers me about the whole thing, I know there's been two recent instances involving the fire department um, that have been very public. And, uh, you know, we work alongside the men and women at the fire department on a daily basis. And, you know, all it takes is maybe one or two bad instances and the public starts, you know, thinking down about the fire department, I can tell you right now, they, they're they fantastic. Uh, we work, our men and women work alongside their, their personnel on a daily basis, and they do a great job. I mean, they really do. We're talking with uh, Chief Mark Williams of uh, the uh, Utica Police Department, and uh, you've been two cases in the last six months have been asked to investigate the Utica Fire Department. Um, I, I, um, I, I do want to ask you, um, uh, there are people, including myself, I, I find this very baffling, uh, the the punishment. Uh, we don't know the punishment, but we do know the outcome. And that is that um, that this, uh, this fire chief is going to be allowed to continue as deputy fire chief. Now, after all of this went on, and, and people have had the opportunity to read the, uh, the text messages, Text messages that that date all the way up to um, to March of this year, uh, it seems. How does how can he continue on in the capacity of deputy chief with all of this out there? And do you feel the punishment from the city is in line with punishments maybe that uh, that have have been imposed on others? 
as far as the punishment, I even I don't know what it yeah. was. Um, well, we know the outcome, though. He still remains deputy fire chief. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just view it from our standpoint. Had this happened in our department, we would view this as a very serious violation of our department policy. Um, and on top of it, you know, being a supervisor, you're expected your code of conduct is supposed to be that much higher yeah. of your subordinates. So, um, would you have been tougher? I'm sorry. Would you have your would you have imposed a tougher penalty? Um, it's hard to say because I don't know what the yep. what the disposition of the case Fair was. Fair enough. And I'm putting you in a yeah. tough position, and I no, apologize no, for that. I, I can appreciate the, the question, <clears throat> though. Yeah. I just don't uh, know the disposition of it. Should there be a public safety commissioner? You know, I was asked this question the other day, and um, no, I, I'll, I'll work with anybody. I mean, I always pride myself being able to work with anybody. But over the 30 years plus that I've been on the job, every public safety commissioner – hasn't really affected the daily operations of a police department. Uh, pretty much the, the, the chiefs run their, their agencies, and uh, it always seems like the public safety commissioner serves as a buffer for the mayor. Right, right. So if something happens to public safety, he can blame the public safety commissioner. Right. Chances are he's going to put somebody in there that is going to just do what he wants them to do anyway. Chances True. are. True. You know? Um, any other uh, any other questions? Uh, it's not an easy position uh, to be in. No. I, I, I certainly... Uh, I certainly understand that. Uh, people are now saying, based on this, and I have like 20 seconds, should uh, the shifts change and people, firefighters spending the night, uh, should that change? It's hard for me to say. I, I mean, not being a, a member of the fire department, as far as their shifts, I know they're contractually negotiated. Yeah. So they would have to. It is going to be something that you, you mm-hmm. that is going to be brought up. I have a right. feeling in the common council. I am out of time, but sure. sit tight. We'll continue this on the other side. Yeah. At least wrap it up. 